my lord, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Maritime London seminar. Um, we have a distinguished panel here who I'll introduce shortly. I also see some very distinguished members in the audience. And so in the unlikely event of the panel drying up, we'll come to the audience maybe sooner, but we will allow time for plenty of questions. And for anyone online, if you if you submit a question to Josh Standerwick, he will make sure that it's drawn to my attention, but he is quality control on the question, so it better be a good question. Um, when I have introduced the panel, Clay Maitland will stand up here and do a positioning statement, which I will then ask the other panel members to comment on, and then we'll get into the discussion of, of the topics that you've probably seen. But to remind people, what we're talking about is what does an increasingly polarized world mean for shipping? Shipping is a uniquely international and pragmatic industry. However, as the far-reaching sanctions against Russia have demonstrated, shipping is not immune from the geopolitical uncertainty. As the international landscape becomes more fractious, how will shipping interests adapt? And what effect will this have on shipping clusters? In this seminar, we'll explore the current geopolitical risk environment and the potential shipping clusters can work more closely to develop a shared understanding. We will talk about things other than decarbonisation. I'm sure the topic will come up during this. So to introduce the panel, let me first introduce Sophia Brown, General Manager, the New York Office of uh, the International Register and the Marshall Islands Registry. Uh, she joined them in 2012 and in 20, March 21 was promoted to General Manager of the New York Office. She's obviously the person who does all the work with play. Um, and so she's the, she's the real expert. Second, and this is getting getting the poacher, I think is the best way of putting it, into the pen. We're very fortunate to have Richard Mead here, editor of Lloyd's List. And I'm not going to ask him the question I usually ask him, which is when is he going to bring back the print edition of Lloyd's List? But he is famous for having abolished it, but I'm not going to ask that question anymore. <laughs> He is he is an award-winning journalist and he is the host of the popular Lloyd's pod Lloyd's Shipping Podcast. I do recommend it. Um, he has a great sense of humor, a little bit cynical, of course. Um, but we're very fortunate to have him here. Right. And if you've been reading any of the articles in Lloyd's list about all these topical issues, you will see that the quality of the journalism is really very, very good. And uh, it means he's got good sources. Uh, but but the argument and the everything else about them is also very good. Uh, at the end, he really needs no introduction, but I will introduce him, Harry Theachari, long-standing head of the maritime business at Norton Rose, now a consultant to them. Uh, he's won several awards. I'm not going to list them all, Harry, in that time. Um, and, uh, but more importantly, he was actually awarded the OBE for services to the UK maritime industry this year. He's chair emeritus of Maritime UK, and he's also chair of Maritime London. And you'll hear from him today, and no doubt you'll hear from him later over dinner. Now, unfortunately, I have to cancel the rest of the seminar in order to read Clay Maitland's CV, um, <laughs> but I, which I won't. But he was born in London, and if it were not for the tragic circumstances of Adolf Hitler, your father died when you were very young, he would by now be Lord Maitland. You probably prefer wouldn't you? Um, Clay doesn't really need an introduction. He's a great philanthropist. He's very well known through shipping circles and very influential uh, and really, I think, typ typifies uh, really what the sort of New York London maritime partnership is all about. And so rather than taking up time listing all your achievements and all your awards, your degrees and everything else, I'm going to give the time for you, Clay, to make the position. So. Well, I consider this gathering, thank you very much, Michael. It's already a success because uh, uh, Michael could have said a lot more about all of us that would have been much more difficult to deal with and much more offensive than you didn't. And I want to thank you for that uh, very much, Michael. Uh, before we go into what uh, is called, I didn't know what a positioning statement was at all, and I still don't, but I was asked by, by uh, Joe Standwick and by Olga Jakes uh, to 
prepare a positioning statement. So here goes. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Olga for all the work that she has done. For those of you who don't know Olga, Olga is the brains behind Harry Piacciari uh, and, and uh, certainly behind Joseph. And we're very grateful, Olga, for everything you do to, to, to make uh, Maritime UK, Maritime London a success. Uh, uh, you you uh, really are, uh, give service to all of us on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, that having been said, uh, as they say at the IMO, which is always a dangerous thing, whenever they say that having been said, it means that the IMO, that something is about to be said, which is grossly uh, inaccurate and very offensive. And I hope I will not be that way today. But if I am, Richard will write it up. But no question about that. Um, I uh, sort of suggested at one point when we were going back and forth on, uh, by email over the last couple of months, what to say and what to talk about. Um, I said, why don't, why don't we talk about the big what if? The big what if is not about, about uh, decarbonization. That's a, we, that's a whole series of what ifs. But the big uh, what if that I would like to talk about a little bit as a positioning statement, and I think we all are uh, concerned about, but we don't talk about very much, is what happens if something happens in the, China, in the Taiwan Straits? Uh, in other words, we uh, don't know this is very, very timely because this week there are various things happening in China. We don't know how far that's going to go, but we do know that President Xi over the past year or two has been making more and more out of the need to bring Taiwan into the People's Republic of China. And often the implication is by force if necessary. Uh, it's no secret that our industry, the shipping industry, is very dependent on trade with China and have been for a great many years. And that's certainly a vulnerability, but it's not the only vulnerability that we have. The other problem that we have with, with uh, trade with the Far East uh, is the uh, degree to which um, we are dependent on Taiwan. Taiwan is the world's second largest and maybe the first largest uh, producer of microprocessors. It has much more strategic importance than one might think for a very small place like Taiwan and uh, a country that isn't even a member of the IMO or the United Nations. So there are some unusual factors at play in all of this. Uh, the, uh, I'm here in my capacity as chairman of something called NIMAR, New York Maritime which is much smaller than Maritime London, but is nevertheless uh, dedicated to the proposition that we all are in one big industry and that we should not practice beggar thy neighbor policies towards each other. We really do have to get along Singapore, New York, Piraeus, London, especially London, play a huge part in our industry. And we really, uh, 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 it's very hard to tell where one ends and the other begins. We have to all work together. We also need to be able to, um, and, and we often refer to London as a cluster. I hate the word cluster. I would prefer to use the word hub. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of, of potential in this industry. Uh, I, I know people will ask, well, why is Neymar here today? Why are Sophia here and Cynthia Rowe and myself. Well, the reason we're here, frankly, is we think that there is going to be a second big bang here in London. And that big bang, when it comes and it's coming, and you can see it on the front page of the, of the Financial Times today, this morning, uh, is very much uh, uh, credit, going to have an impact on the shipping industry here. And we think a beneficial one. And uh, it will have, we hope, a beneficial impact on the largely ship finance oriented uh, industry, the shipping industry in the greater New York area. Uh, and so while we're talking about China and we're talking about the, uh, the danger of, of a situation arising in the next couple of months or years, if China makes a military move and if sanctions are clamped on China in some, heaven forbid, in some way, uh, we also, I think, ought to try to feel uh, a sense of how London as a shipping hub and New York as a shipping hub and definitely Singapore and uh, our Greek colleagues are going to react to all of this. Uh, so that's the position. 
um, we can, and I think should seek hedging strategies if things go pear-shaped in terms of trade with China. Uh, we being the whole global maritime industry. And I think there are things that we can actually do globally in London, in New York, elsewhere, to deal with the problems that will arise if military activities or even a blockade by the People's Republic of China, heaven forbid, does happen. I'm not making predictions, but my feeling is it's very likely that it will. I don't think that President, was a little too much fun last night, uh, President Xi is going to um, uh, be able to back away from the political position and indeed the military position that he is working himself into. Uh, now, a number of things, I think, and I hope that this positioning statement will suggest questions from you. Uh, I work for a uh, one of the leading, and I, I use the term open flags of convenience. Other people like to call them open registries. And one of the things that we are concerned about, and I think we all should be concerned about, is that and we've seen this in the case of the action in the Black Sea, is the presence of non-existent ship registries in, uh, uh, in which uh, are associated with so-called dark fleet. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that term. I know, Richard, you are. Uh, and with or sometimes called gray fleets. Many of the ships that are now operating in the areas of military activity, which are growing, includes Iran, includes Venezuela, uh, where wherever sanctions exist, in other words, are indeed um, registered in places like Guinea-Bissau and Tanzania. Uh, the question has been raised, and this is particularly pertinent to what the IMO has been trying to do in recent years. What exactly control does the international community have over ships that are registered in flag states that nobody can find even with a telephone? Uh, what is going to happen to ESG, what we used to call corporate social responsibility, and I hope I'm not being too glib about equating ESG with it, but many of the things that are being espoused now in terms of responsible management procedures under the ISM code are geared to the big states, the Liberias, the Panamas, the uh, Marshall Islands, not to dealing with states that, in effect, are not registries at all. I know that's a controversial statement, but you'll hear some more of that about that from me. Um, we uh, are not clear on uh, how this is going to affect decarbonization. And I think decarbonization does have a relevant uh, part to play in our discussions here today. It's a fair question as to whether the flag states and the coastal states and other governments are going to be able to cope with that if a significant number of vessels trading to China are in fact flying uh, flags that almost cannot be said to exist. And uh, in that context, and I'll tip my hat to, uh, to Richard here, my colleague on my right, uh, the, uh, as you have pointed out uh, in, in, in your writing, uh, if you look at the sale and purchase uh, market in uh, in the last, well, certainly the last 10 months, say this calendar year, uh, how many of them were to tankers, for example, and it's not just tankers, were to undisclosed purchasers? Uh, the point that I'm getting at is that I think there's a lot of people in the market who quite rightly feel, as I do, and many of them are Greek ship owners, that um, we are going to see hostilities and that uh, it's better to have a large inventory of secondhand tonnage that can be deployed in a situation like that, because I don't think the shipping industry is simply going to dry up if there's hostilities between Taiwan and China. I think that people are going to be running cargoes in and out of, of the, uh, uh, the, the Taiwan Strait, the major ports in China. And, but those, those ships are not necessarily going to be the ships that we now see. Which you know the the Maersk those beautiful nice baby blue painted Maersk container ships that type of ship, uh, I think that the big companies are going to be very reluctant to run the risk of drones hitting their ships, uh, of of other military activi activities, and I know that uh, some of our other colleagues are going to ask today 
what are the seafarers? The seafarers are the people who are going to be running the ships into a war zone, just as they are now in the Black Sea. Uh, very little is said, at least to my knowledge, and I may be wrong about this, as to the safety of life of seafarers in these situations. We are seeing an increasing number of military events. The most important and famous one is now uh, around the Black Sea in Ukraine. But I think we're going to see a lot more of risk to the lives and safety of seafarers if in fact hostilities do, heaven forbid, break out in the uh, Far East. Uh, so there is, uh, I, I could say a lot more, but due to limitations of time, I'm just going to say that a few years ago, we all heard the term black swans. One thing that I think that we can do, and I think that Maritime London, Maritime UK, what people like Joe Sandwick are doing and, and Harry, you're doing, uh, and uh, Lord Mount Evans, uh, you're not completely retired yet, are you, Jeffrey? Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the fact of the matter is we do need to get better at being able to uh, anticipate uh, the what ifs, particularly if the what ifs seem a bit unpleasant. Uh, we found this out with sanctions in the past two years or so, or so and we're going to find it out even more so with China. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I am very happy to sit down and leave you alone, but I hope I've suggested a few questions that you will ask us and one another during the course of today's gathering. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you, Clay. Um, and indeed, I think what ifs uh, is a good way of putting it because in 2015, it was Bill Gates who said, what if there is a global pandemic? Um, and no one in this room, I think, was alive during the last one. Um, there's a lot in there. I, what I think I'll do is I'll ask Richard, then Harry, then Sophia to comment on not everything they said, but to pick one thing you strongly agree with or one thing you strongly disagree with. Uh, and be brief and say why, and then we'll sort of develop a discussion on that. Richard, we will come back no, to the dark fleet at some point. Um, there is a lot there to unpack. Right. One thing I agree with is that this fragmentation of uh, trade is infinitely adaptable with shipping. Uh, you saw it with the um, Ever Given's uh, ill-judged mini break in Suez. Uh, where we basically watched the fragility of the global supply chain in real time break down and the consequences of that. The takeaway I would suggest is probably most positive is the fact that we are now seeing that same supply chain get back to normal or something resembling. Uh, shipping is very good at working its way around these problems. Uh, now, yes, there has been huge disruption to the global supply chain. And yes, you have seen uh, litres and litres of ink uh, amongst my colleagues in the press uh, opine on um, the impact of the supply chain and how we need to invest in resilience, uh, how we need to uh, accelerate reshoring and nearshoring. Uh, none of that is happening. Uh, none of the data bears that out. It is a myth. Uh, it is not happening in any way, shape, or form. I challenge anyone to point the data that suggests otherwise. Um, what is happening is that you are seeing some redundancies be examined. You are seeing some, uh, you know, backup plans. But what you're not seeing is a complete redrawing of the global trade maps in anticipation of another choke point going down. Because I think that is still, frankly, unthinkable. What you are thinking about there is balancing the security of additional supply chains with the, uh, the realities of global economics as they stand right now. And globalization, as we have known it since the post-war period, has been built off very cheap transport. And the trade does not account for the fact that shipping is there to carry that trade. Um, it's as simple as that. Now, if you want to increase that cost, as we do, in order to decarbonize and to make uh, the global supply chain that much more efficient, you are going to see costs increase. 
Now, during the pandemic, we have seen an exercise that was otherwise going to be theoretical. Uh, and the world did not stop turning. Ships kept moving. Global trade kept carrying on. We have seen some of the most um, disruptive periods in, in global trade history. And yet we are still here. We are still here in, in relatively normal bands of freight rates and operations. And shipping has kept the world moving, I would suggest. So, yes, things will happen. Yes, there will be shocks. But I do fundamentally believe that shipping will be infinitely adaptable to those shocks. Um, what that industry looks like in the long run, I think, is probably going to be more determined by the cost that you apply to those ESG models and the business models that survived will be the ones that are based on, I would argue, uh, efficiency, uh, reliability, and uh, a shipping industry is a little bit more boring than the one that we are looking at today. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. All right. <clears throat> I, I must say that I, I, I fully agree with Richard. I'd just like to add a little bit to what he said. Um, Look, shipping always finds a way. We've seen big shocks before. Um, this was before my time. I know I looked terribly old, but I wasn't around at the time of the Suez crisis. But, you know, shipping found a way. And great ship owners came out of that period. People like Onassis, people like Niarchos. During the Iran-Iraq war, similar issues. Supply lines were badly cut, decimated in places. You had people like John Friedrichson, the Hajiwani family. Uh, shipping always does find a way. And it needs to. Um, what we need to understand is that global trade can't be conducted without shipping. 80% of world trade is conducted on board vessels. It's 95% in the United Kingdom. So we always have to find a way. I think it's absolutely imperative. And I, I say, I fully agree with Richard that shipping will find that way. Because if I may say so, if you look, if you look at the great shipping nations around the world, they are tremendously good businessmen and they can see opportunities and they see shipping as a commodity. That's what shipping has become. It's a commodity. It's part of the supply chain. The bad news is that dictators around the world have also worked that out. And they've also realized that actually, if you can affect shipping in an adverse way, you can starve great big chunks of North Africa uh, by, by, by stopping uh, 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 grains moving from the Ukraine. Uh, it's, it's a very dangerous position we find ourselves in. But uh, look, I, 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 unlike Clay, I don't believe China will actually do anything uh, as serious as perhaps invading uh, Taiwan. I think the Chinese economy is so dependent on us, as we are unfortunately on them, that it is an economic balance of terror. Uh, I can see them saber rattling, but I, I honestly can't see um, uh, action, military action being taken. Um, the other thing that I fully agree with Clay is that my big, the, the big bone I have with ESG is that you know it talks about the environment, it talks about social, it talks about governance. But do you know what? The seafarer never seems to to figure in any of this. At a at a, a shipping conference which we hosted uh, in Pyrrhus. Uh, earlier this year, during Posidonia, Harry Fafalios, the chairman of the Greek Shipping Corporation Committee, had a, a series of newspaper articles. A vessel, two vessels had collided, and there was an oil spill. And the first question everybody asks is, oh my goodness, how many birds are going to be caught in this slip? How many fish are going to die? Not one of those newspapers said, how many men on board that vessel have died? And what I find quite tragic is even today, uh, I sit in meetings and I hear people defending situations where seafarers have to pay for clean drinking water on board their vessels, where they have to pay for Wi-Fi so they, they can communicate with their families. Now, that simply can't be right. And I think we, there needs to be a lot more emphasis on the seafarer because, let's be clear about this, without the seafarer, there is no shipping industry. Thank you, Aaron. I'm pleased you're a bit more optimistic about China than Clay. You put the flak jackets away for a bit. <laughs> Sophia. Well, I agree with uh, Clay, Richard, and Harry and what they said about the shipping industry being adaptable to change. I think that we've proven throughout history that this industry manages to 
deal with change well. We know how to innovate and get things done. And global trade hasn't stopped at any point, despite any of the challenges that we've faced. But that being said, we have been facing some unique challenges lately, and we have some more challenges to come. And I think that as an industry, we do need to be better prepared to face those challenges. There's a lot of uh, shock that's coming to the industry. It's all happening at once. Um, and we do need to figure out how to mitigate the risks that are coming from that. I also heavily agree with Harry about the seafarers because, like he said, the seafarers are what's really driving the ships. That's what's getting all of these global commodities around the world. And without enough seafarers, which we are facing a shortage of seafarers, without the seafarers, we aren't going to have as heavy global trade as we've been having historically. Uh, also, with the new implementation of technologies and the need to reduce the carbon footprint, there's going to be new shifts, there's going to be new technologies, and the seafarers just simply aren't trained for it. There isn't enough uh, investment in the training of seafarers and in the training of their safety at life at sea in, when it involves these new technologies and these new fuels. Thank you. A number of things you mentioned that I will come back to, but I think we must talk about the issue of the day because as of Monday, ship owners, insurance companies, and other people are in danger of breaking the law in the United States. The EU, the G7, and Australia, and anyone else that signs up to it. So maybe let's talk, Richard, about sort of the point Clay raised about unregistered ships. Let's talk about the dark fleet. Um, and then Harry and Clay will talk and be able to get about the sanctions. Um, whether you think they work. So are there enough ships out there that make what the West is trying to do really just infected? Um, yes and no. I think, broadly speaking, as with any issue in shipping, we can crudely divide it up into the, the good, the compliant, and the ugly. Um, you know, there is a good uh, coalition of the willing, the, the global maritime forum set who set the pace of the industry and do good things in blue chip companies and go them. That's great. That's not the reality of the majority of the shipping industry, which is a huge fragmented middle. Um, in terms of the average ship owner that owns five and a half ships, depending on how you calculate it, the reality is they are trying to be compliant. And that's not because they're a bunch of environmental pirates or they are trying to uh, skirt uh, you know, regulations on a daily basis, but it's not most of them. Um, they are trying to do that because it is a thin margin business where it is difficult to make a buck. And this is the nature of global trade. It is not expensive enough, frankly. So we go back to that, but that is the compliant middle. Then you have a very thin sliver at the bottom that is the ugly bit. And it has always been there. Uh, we have always had uh, opaque and dodgy aspects of this industry. It is part and parcel of how global trade works. So that is the broad picture. Um, on the issue of the, the, the great fleet, the shadow fleet, the dark fleet, I wouldn't call it the great fleet, actually, but that tends to be what we call um, in our, our naval covers. But, um, uh, mm -hmm. There are currently, depending on how you classify it, in the region, I would say, uh, 300 vessels currently bobbing around the ocean where we have limited intelligence in terms of what they are doing. And that's partly technical, it's partly because a lot of the intelligence is looking at it from the fairly basic uh, application of, of where their AIS signals are. Um, AIS was never designed for that job, by the way. It was an avoidance of collision technology that has been um, effectively adapted to try and do other things because the LRIT, the long range tracking that was set up inside the IMO and exists as a very good tool, is only available to United States and governments who don't want to share that information. Uh, but that's another story. Um, the, the reality is that what used to be a fairly blunt tool of turning your AIS off and doing dodgy things and then coming back online is long gone. That is quite quaint compared to the state level subterfuge and deceptive practices that are going on out there. We've had a cat and mouse evolution through uh, the Iranians, the Venezuelans, who have got quite sophisticated at being able to spoof satellite signals and to see a ship that is physically in one place uh, while appearing in another place to all intents and purposes on computers. Um, 
say what you like about the Russians, but they are getting really quite good at this. What, whatever the Iranians achieved, the Russians are doing much better. They are really good at deceptive practices. Um, they've had a long history of this. So there is um, a problem, but I wouldn't overplay the problem because it's still within the realm of 300 ships-ish. Now, that could well change. Um, the reality is where there are sanctions to get around, some people will try to get around it. Sanctions, let's not forget, are a policy tool. They are a, uh, a, a, an economic tool. We tend to think of them as being homogenous and as uh, a single thing. They're not. They are very complex, and they are a series of national attempts to control international behaviors. Now, there is the US and back and there's other sanctions that are applying and there's the EU regime. We have our individual UK regime uh, and ship owners are navigating their way through a series of regimes that are increasingly complex and changing by the day. Anybody who's been tracking the detail, and I know there's lots of people in the room do, but the daily updates and general license agreements and exceptions and things that we are supposed to understand as journalists, I am struggling to keep up with that. And I know there is a small army of lawyers that haven't been sleeping much over the last 18 months, precisely because the rest of the shipping industry doesn't understand that as well. And a lot of this expertise has been outsourced. I don't want to take up too much time, but the one thing I would say is that the governments themselves do not understand this. So when uh, our beloved transport secretary tweeted policy on the fly and decided that uh, the beneficial ownership of Russia were not going to be welcome in UK ports, uh, what followed was an interesting 24-hour period where our ports were effectively Googling and phoning Roy's list to see whether or not the ships that were coming into their ports were in fact a little bit Russian. And that was the level of intelligence that they were left with. The government had no idea how to identify anything beyond something that was flagged in Russia. Look out the window, does it have a Russian flag? No, well, in that case, we can't really help them, I'm afraid. It was the general response that the Department of Transport were giving ports and ship owners at that point. Uh, now, we've been doing this for some time, and we were more than happy to uh, help out our, our British government with some intelligence as to where the beneficial ownership really lies. And it turned out it was a bit bigger than they thought. Um, now, that is one example, but I think the reality is that these policies are created uh, by governments that don't necessarily understand how effective these things are going to be. Sanctions are very leaky in the long run. They're quite effective to start with, and then people find their way around. We started by saying shipping is quite adaptable. Well, yeah, the dark bit at the bottom of the shipping industry is extremely adaptable for getting around these things. And sooner or later, they will find some way. And then we go back into this cat and mouse evolution of sanctions. So it's not a singular situation. It's a very fluid one. So you're very good at not answering my question, but I do, I do want, which I'm come back to, but I want to say in the old days, every cabinet minister, you got to work in the morning, would have a copy of the Times and a copy of Lloyd's List on his desk. So maybe if they had that, they'd be better informed. Do you, do you, do you think that the 300 vessels will serve Russia's purposes for getting the oil it wants to sell at the right price? Therefore, the cap will simply be non effective because of the amount non-compliant ships that we need to be on. I, I, I think however much the EU and the G7 try to impose this, there is a reality of economics at some level where if the discount on the oil price is sufficient, India and China will buy it and there will be mechanisms to find that oil a route through some way. Uh, and you mentioned that the ships that have been going into the S&P markets into really complex opaque structures that we've been looking at mm -hmm. and i can go into some depth on this because trust me we've been taking photos of these office blocks that are you know housing several hundred of these vessels uh, at some points we lose trails uh, of the various individual people that are owning these ships and the very strong suspicion is that these are state-run operations and these finance state-run operations so can i prove that no because there are too many lawyers in this room, but I would strongly suggest that uh, there are some state level intelligence that might want to be looking at who owns this vessel. Let's let's go to the lawyers. I, I agree with you because I got calls in May, I think, from my colleagues asking questions, particularly around the insurance side. It was clear from the questions that they asked that the people in the US Treasury asked them questions didn't really understand how shipping works. So, first to Clay and then to you, Harry. Why is it that governments like the US and the UK um, dream up these things without talking to people like me first to explain how these things could work better immediately. 
Well, uh, I'll put on my American hat now and tell you that in the United States, our government has virtually no knowledge, a very slight knowledge of anything to do with commercial shipping uh, or indeed uh, bank, the, but the financing aspects, the things, things that you get involved in, uh, Michael, uh, certainly uh, banking, uh, they come to us occasionally. And I mean by that, the CIA, the FBI, the Treasury Department in the United States, which are the law, main law enforcement arms, and they ask us how all of these things work. Well, we have a particularly leaky situation in the United States, speaking of leakiness, because we have a thing called the state of Delaware. Our president happens to come from the state of Delaware. Uh, if any of you have visited uh, in Istanbul, or if you will, Constantinople, you'll see the ferry boats going back and forth across the Bosphorus, flying little American flags. And the first time I went to Istanbul many years ago, and I saw the little American flags fluttering from these, these antiquated ferry boats, I asked somebody, why are they all flying American flags? And isn't that nice? They must really love us in Istanbul. Well, nothing, nothing like that at all. They're all incorporated in the state of Delaware through the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles, the, the various, uh, you know, small ship operators and uh, ferry boat operators uh, in the Bosporus and the Dardanelles. Uh, that's the story there. Uh, the state of Delaware puts the Marshall Islands and Liberia to shame in terms of its ability to uh, completely obfuscate the ownership of the people who form corporations there. I think there are probably people in this room who have taken advantage of or become aware of that fact that you don't really need to go to the Marshall Islands at all to form a corporation. You can do it online right from here with the state of Delaware. They're very happy to do business with you. And believe me, your client or you will not be visible to anybody, including Richard Mead. So that's I'm, I realize that's not answering your question, but it gets more and more obscure. And, and uh, the, the, I'm sure we're going to see examples of this. Uh, uh, and the amazing thing is that when the American authorities do become aware of it, which they are, they 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 blame uh, uh, the Marshall Islands and Liberia and Panama and Cyprus and Vanuatu and you name it. But they don't come to the state of Delaware, which is uh, only a few miles from Washington, D.C., and ask them whether they're going to uh, open up their books. I, I know I haven't been helpful, no, I, but I, I could just make a comment and then I'll ask Harry to give a more educated. Nothing about this is helpful. <laughs> educated answer to my question. Um, given that um, the U.S. has the ability to help the Ukraine target individual human beings from thousands of miles away, uh, and we've seen what drones can do, mm. one assumes, one being the general public, that. The U.S. in particular has the capability to know where all these ships are. The technology is there, the physical equipment is there. I that there is a lot being tolerated and known about. Nothing. I, I think you're absolutely right about that. That may be to your point about states. Mm -hmm. It's effectively a state mm -hmm. operation. That, mm -hmm. that yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is an, there is an aspect to the way in which we haven't spoken about enforcement, but the way in which enforcement on sanctions has happened is deliberately quite mercurial in the sense that they need to be a little bit opaque about how they're going to enforce it in order to make the good bit and the compliant bit of the shipping industry scared enough that they could potentially do it and then they sell such. That's part of the process. But I, yes, there are parts of the US intelligence network that do know, they just don't show that information to the rest of the US. No. Harry. I think you're right. Um, <clears throat> In, in defence, Richard and the British government, uh, when sanctions sanctions issues first did arise, we had a lot of calls from members of Maritime London. And I must say, once we actually got speaking with the DFT and and with Ben Wallace's people, um, we did start to get a really clear idea of you know, what the sanctions were about and what people had to be aware of. What I do agree with is that it's, it is a, it's a hugely opaque area. And as a lawyer, I hate to tell you this, but I could hide a ship in an ownership that you will never find. And I bet my reputation on it. It's very easy for me. I can shift it around the world on a daily basis. You'd never know where it was, whose ownership it was. Uh, and that's part of the problem. We have too many flags of convenience. There's not enough control. We need to look at this as a whole. The other thing I would say to you is I had a call, and I won't publicise them, there is a, a, a listed a company listed on the London Stock Exchange that rang me and said, we can tell you where every single ship on the planet is and what it's doing. Um, now, 
you know, that's available. They do publicize themselves. I won't publicize them here, but if any of you are interested, I'll gladly give you their name. Uh, they are Israeli Mossad people who have set up this organization. Uh, they're a properly incorporated, as a London listed entity, and they can tell you exactly what's going on, where there are false things and so forth. You know, as, as Michael said, you know, there is this technology that can pinpoint a human being so the drone hits him in a car. Surely they can work out where these vessels are. So it's because I, I believe they're choosing not to. And my honest view is that a lot of these sanctions are just going to be unenforceable for the most part. Uh, people will always find a way around them. And there are too many states who, you know, will have a personal interest. It's absolutely right that India and China are going to carry on buying Russian oil if it's in their interests. What do they care what the US does? As China certainly doesn't. Uh, why should they comply with what we need? So, you know, there are, I, I think, you know, it's a, it's a very, very difficult problem. It's a political problem that I, it's well above my pay grade as a lawyer. But I honestly don't see any answer to it. And I don't see sanctions as being the answer either. Especially as the burden falls on banks and insurers and others. Mm -hmm. Right, you said. Ah. You want to say something? Yeah, well, just as a brief follow-up to Harry. The, the, the thing, again, going back to the seafarer, the thing that is often missed, we do not talk enough about, is that when we sanction these fleets and we sanction these vessels, what happens is they go outside of mainstream control. So the Russian class society is a sanctioned against. What happened was the ships that they were looking after had gone elsewhere. Uh, the IX PI clubs are no longer able to touch the majority of these ships. So they have gone outside of that control. Um, we are now not able to inspect as an industry a good portion of these ships. Now that doesn't strike me as a particularly good idea, given these are the ships that were, let's be honest, a little bit dodgy to start with. These are not, you know, the well-maintained five-year-old ships. These are the dodgy 20-year-old ships that were probably going to be, you know, most likely to have an accident in the first place. And now they're the ones that are unclassed, uninsured, and performing dangerous ship-to-ship -ship transfer operations in the middle of the Kerr Strait. That doesn't strike me as a very good idea. Um, so I think, you know, there is a balance here between security and the reality of what these ships are going to have to do. We're going to have to find some way of making this safe. Could I just add a comment on that? Because Harry spoke as a lawyer. I'll speak as a lawyer for a minute. I'm not as good a lawyer as Harry. Well, I was a delegate. I'm as, as one of the probably the oldest person in the room. I was a delegate to the United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, when I was representing another flag state. Uh, and I can tell you that the UNCLOS Convention, which is the supposed Bible for uh, all of what we're talking about here, plus the IMO conventions, SOLAS, MARPOL, the CLC, Civil Liability Convention, Fund Conventions, all of the Bible uh, basic uh, uh, conventions that we stake everything on in in the in the maritime industry, at least if we're following the law, uh, those conventions predate the situation that that Michael and everybody else here is describing, and that I described a few minutes ago. The situation we now are in with regard to the so-called dark fleet with regard to transponders being turned off and AIS being turned off. None of that was really the technology of the 1970s and 80s that we now face. Uh, and, and therefore, the, the legal structures are way, way, way out of date. Uh, I'm sure this has dawned on people who are responsible, you know, at IMO and in, the, in, the, in our governments, the governments of the OECD countries particularly which means that we're long overdue for a complete overhaul of the legal system, including the Convention on the Law of the Sea. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is that this is an enormously heavy lift to the international community to actually reopen the books on all the things that we thought we had put to bed successfully uh, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Uh, and that I don't see the will to do that yet. But what I think we're all sort of hinting at here is that that will may definitely appear, and I certainly hope it does. Uh, it's going to take a lot of things that the IMO is not uh, on the south bank of the Thames here. It may mean some fundamental changes in the way we as nation states, the fundamentally large and important nation states, 
uh, approach the problems of safety at sea, the welfare of, and the safety of the lives of seafarers and passengers, the safety of, of, of the oceans. And indeed, uh, uh, as, as a famous uh, Lord Chancellor said years ago, I was actually a master of the roles here, uh, safer ships, cleaner seas. We're still seeking for safer ships and cleaner seas, but I think the machinery that we now have in place is not adequate to do the job. Thank you, Claire. I think I think what you're saying is the question is, is the IMO, the League of Nations, we need a different global regulator to address some of these issues. So we'll just leave that hanging there. I want to shift gear towards decarbonization. If anyone has any questions around the sanctions and dark fleet issue, when we get to questions, feel free to ask them, but there are the important topics we need to talk about. So here, I want to turn to you, and you'll forgive me for um, putting a generational aspect to this, but the issue of decarbonization. A, a lot of, uh, and I want you to answer from two perspectives, one a generational issue, and the other is as running a register, and responsibilities a register should have for this. Um, there is a lot of view, I suppose, since the invasion of Ukraine, that there were more important things to do than decarbonize, which is true of energy security, food security. But from a generational perspective, are you optimistic post COP27? Are you, do you think that the registry can do more around this particular topic? And let's move out of Russia, Ukraine, and sanctions into decarbonization. And give me your thoughts. Well, <clears throat> to be completely honest, I'm not optimistic about decarbonization and shipping. I think it would be wonderful if it's something that we could do, but it's just happening too slowly. And there's not enough research. There's not enough money and investment being put into decarbonizing shipping. We, we really need support from outside industries. I think we need support from the government, um, not to harp on the sanctions, but uh, even that, that has had an effect on emissions and shipping because you see tanker owners feeling the strain with the longer routes that they have to now navigate because of the sanctions. And so they're buying older ships. Older ships means more pollution. Um, and so it's really a vicious cycle. Uh, as far as registries are concerned, I think we do play a vital role in helping to reduce the emissions and helping to uh, push the industry to decarbonize, but it it can't only fall on the registry. Uh, Marshall Islands is the, we have the youngest and greenest fleet. Our average age is eight years old for a vessel, but on the seas, uh, it's 22 years old. That's the average age. So registries should be more strict on the age of their vessels. That alone would help. Uh, but we do need to see more innovation and uh, innovation needs research that needs funding. And so all in all, I think we're, we're doing things way too slowly. There isn't enough focus on the, uh, on the long-term goal. What are, you, what are you expecting in CII results to publish for all the ships under the National Heritage Registry? Are you poised for action or are you optimistic that the ratings of the Marshall Islands Registry be better than other ones? Oh, I think they'll be better than the ratings. We'll check. We should <laughs> check when they come out. Right? Um, the issue of um, Going back to the sort of disruption issue caused by COVID or supply chain disruption, knock on effect, we have every sector of shipping that has, um, even the cruise sector has come back, even if you do offshore drilling, that's now back to where it was before 2014 in terms of the rates and things. Um, is, my view on this is that ship owners are making a lot of money, therefore, can invest in any of these things. What can a registry do around that type of um, compunction is probably too strong a word, but how can you as a registry encourage investment in the right things for ships under your registry where ship owners can no longer use the excuse I've got that on? Um, I think that the, the registry, we can certainly try to offer incentives. We can try to explain to ship owners why it's important. Uh, tomorrow, we have our Marshall Islands Quality Council, which is, you know, we get together a group of industry stakeholders and we, we discuss these topics. We talk about these issues and that's actually something that used to be 
very helpful because uh, you have to get together in a room with all different sides of the equation in order to figure out what you might be able to do together. And I think that the registry, uh, all registries really, we need to keep pushing this goal of decarbonization. We need to really emphasize how important it is to have clean shifts and uh, we need to stop accepting anything else. Harry, do you have a view on what owners should do with the money they've been making? Like the problem is that the, the amount of money the owners have been making is just a drop in the ocean. Um, I, I was reading a report by UMass recently, the University Maritime Advisory Service, and you know they're they're coming up with a figure of between 1.7 to 1.9 trillion dollars to decarbonize the shipping industry, and there are some very fine and uh, uh, very well prepared reports uh, stating it to be high as, as 3.5 trillion. This comes at a time when, you know, in real terms, the amount of capital available to the shipping and maritime industry. Is it an all-time low? Uh, you know, banks and financial institutions aren't lending anywhere near the amounts that they were lending back in 2007, for example. Uh, the, the, the capital markets aren't there in reality. The bond markets aren't there in reality. Private equity, why should they take this? The big issue we have at the moment is that, you know, nobody's really sure what the fuel of the future is going to be and what the drive trains are going to be. So... The, the view that uh, I was at a, 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 a maritime Cyprus and there were three very well-known Greek ship, uh, ship owners. In fact, one of them was Greek Cypriot. And the point they made is, look, nobody knows what we should be investing in. Why should I risk my money? Uh, and the banks are taking the same view. You know, this could be, for those of you old enough to remember, a VHS Betamax moment. Uh, you, you, you invest 120, 150 million in a vessel. And then in three or four years, it's it's... It, it's it's really not fit for purpose anymore. So that's a huge issue. What I'm seeing, Michael, much more and more, uh, and particularly as a result of what's what's going on with Russia, is a a movement towards um, uh, carbon capture. People, I think, have realised that we are going to have to live with carbon fuels for the foreseeable future. There aren't going to be a majority of the vessels. Uh, uh, trading uh, on a commercial basis, burning ammonia or methanol or, or, or even nuclear, as some are suggesting, they're still going to be burning fossil fuels. So let, you know, the, the attitude is, let's catch that. In fact, a former colleague of yours has just become the CEO of a Los Angeles carbon capture company. And they're basically saying, look, we know we have a very short-term future, but for the next 20, 30 years, we can capture all of the CO2 emissions. I mean, it's not, it's not 100%, it's 97%. But you know what? That's better than methanol. Even if you burn methanol, you're still going to be producing 3% uh, a carbon dioxide and more. So they have a technology that will capture it. And then they don't, we don't need to sequester it. We can actually use it in products. I, I, uh, forgive me again, this is way above my pay scale as a lawyer, but you can use CO2 to make cement, paper, glass, plastic products. There's a myriad of uses for it, and we just need to create a market. Now, there's a, a ship owner called Peter Livanos. It's about to order a huge number of CO2 vessels. So he must know something. Um, uh, again, I've gone slightly off, off piece here, Michael, but as I say, I think you know, dec look, decarbonization is a human endeavor. Failure isn't an option. Let's be absolutely clear about this. It's something we have to do. But you know, how are we going to do it? And you know, my view is that I will see out my career financing uh, carbon burning vessels in stop. And I just hope that we have the technology to capture that carbon, use it effectively, or get rid of it in some way. Even if we just you know, have to put it down a well. Could I just add one thing to what I agree completely with what Harry has said? Uh, I think we have to look a little bit more optimistically if you're in favor of decarbonization at what certain coastal states and certain port states are doing. A great deal will depend for the shipping industry on where your ships trade. If you have ships going into the state of California and, and Long Beach, California is one of the more active ports. It's the biggest port on North American continent so far by volume. We don't know how long that's gonna last. If things remain at peace with China, it'll last a good long time. California is way ahead of the rest of the world. They're the extremists here. 
they're the ones who are saying we're not going to let automobiles operate within the state of California if they do not meet certain of the targets that we, the state of California, have set, which means that everybody who drives a car in California is going to have to have, uh, you know, be fully compliant with their carbon reduction goals, which means that everybody's going to be driving a Tesla before very long. But that's California. That's not the United Kingdom. And it's certainly not Belarus. Uh, the, uh, but, but if you have a ship trading to, as many container ships do, to California, to this, quote, the port of Long Beach or the port of San Diego, you're going to have to comply with those California regulations. So that skews the market a little bit. There is a lot of places in the world, if you go to Novorossiysk on the Black Sea, I don't think you're going to have to worry too much about how what you, you could burn old shoes there and they'll be perfectly happy. Uh, but the, but the, uh, in certain parts of the world, uh, the, the, the political will is there. Uh, yes, it's there limited in area, but they're nevertheless very significant. If that happens, we, you'll end up what a lot of people, including my friend Richard here, have predicted. You'll have a multi-tier market. You're going to have ships that are burning methanol, that are burning, you know, heaven forbid, ammonia. I hope not, but they, they may very well be. Uh, they're certainly not going to be burning old boots. Uh, and I just think that it's, it's important to remember that when we speak generally about the shipping industry, you really can't speak generally. There are going to be exceptions. My well, I'll just come in very briefly, please forgive me. Um, look, I think that probably works for, for something like cars where there is a tried and tested technology. But let me just give you an example of you know, what, what the, 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 the human cost would be of, of using methanol. Uh, Martin Stockford, who I'm sure you all know, someone I have the highest respect for, uh, sent me a paper that he prepared for uh, a, a, a box carrier, a, a big container company. And they wanted to know, you know how much methanol they would need to burn for one of their largest uh, container uh, carriers and how they could generate that in a green way. And basically, the answer is this. You need one wind turbine that will produce at least 10 megawatts times 36 to produce 400 tons of methanol for one vessel. So you need 36 wind turbines, which would have to work at 10 megawatts a day, which is almost impossible even in the windiest areas. Those 36 uh, wind turbines would cost you 1.1 billion. And that would just power one ship for one day. I mean, that is quite frightening. So, you know, let's look at the reality of all of this. The British government bangs on about methanol, but, you know, we're creating blue methanol in this country. We're creating almost as many emissions as we are using diesel fuels. And, you know, that's just totally unacceptable. So, you know, let's, let's look at this sensibly and, you know, let's, 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 not, let's not be subjective about it. Let's be objective and do the right thing. So I want to close this particular thing by reminding people it used to take six months to order a telephone in the UK through the GPO. That was a landline. And I've now got two of these things, neither of which I, I know I remember. Use properly. I also was asked a question in Hamburg in September of DNB's annual 2050 forecast to compare it with the automobile industry. And we remember when Technology was such that a man walked with a red flag in front of a car, and because it was dangerous to go more than four miles an hour. The money is there. There's 130 trillion that was announced in Glasgow. The money is there. The technology is there. I have to say that because Tristan Smith is in the audience. And I don't want he hasn't got time to rebut the Flat Earth Society of Human Decarbonization. <laughs> so let's just agree to disagree. Um, uh, and I think we will see nuclear shipping in our lifetimes. Um, but I want to turn to Richard, because whether you agree on the pace of this change, we know it's going to happen. Um, Richard and I often, he asks me questions, I'm going to ask him the same question he always asks me. The, the, the changes in the industry are undoubtedly going to change the business model. Two reasons. One is it's going to be driven by cargo, not ship owner. Cargo is going to drive the investment decision. And scale is going to matter. Capital really is going to matter. So this, you know what I'm going to ask you, Richard. You always ask me, what about the squeezed middle 
I want you, and I heard it on a recent podcast, can you define the squeeze a little for the audience? Because you seem to want to represent them in time. What should people do about the squeeze a little? And why should we do anything about them if they don't have the capital and don't have the desire to be proud of the squeeze? And then we'll move to, is there anyone on line? Okay, then we'll move to the audience and some online questions. You're deliberately asking me that question so that I don't kick up on your former colleague becoming somebody who is now sucking in hot air rather than smelling. The squeeze mill. So, I mean, I mentioned previously the uh, the shipping industry can be you know, loosely defined as the, you know, the, the good, uh, the compliant, and, and the ugly. And you know, we take the good as a minority, I would say. You know, these are the people that attend cops and uh, are, are there opining at the Global Maritime Forum, and uh, they are uh, talking directly to uh, Michael and his colleagues at the side and principles, and they are doing all the right things. Arguably, they're only just getting around having the right conversations, in my view, uh, which is not what fuel can I put in my bunker tanks, but how do I become part of a wider global energy transition? That is the right question to be asking. Uh, we, are, unfortunately, as an industry, have been looking too closely at uh, the specifics of what goes in our tanks rather than the business models uh, and the uh, position we find ourselves within a shift in global trade. And that is the point about the Swedes middle. The reality is the average ship owner owns five ships. They're all thereabouts, but five ships. Uh, they are not Maersk. They do not have energy offtake uh, agreements set up with uh, hydrogen powered uh, you know, energy companies that are, are doing deals with cargo. This is not the reality of the industry. The reality of the industry is a small company uh, that, you know, at best has a general counsel dealing with sanctions, uh, probably has, you know, the uh, CFO uh, considering, you know, how it is going to be dealing with some of these things. Um, they are not set up to deal with this. Uh, whether we are talking about the introduction of uh, emissions trading coming in imminently within Europe, whether we are talking about uh, the requirements of CII and EEXI uh, and all of those lovely things that have been written off as probably not going to affect me until 2026. Missing the point, of course, this is a, you know, a continuously restrictive, uh, uh, a progressive piece of regulation that will affect you, it will affect your ships, and you are going to have to start paying attention. Shipping is becoming increasingly complex, and ship owners, I'm afraid to say, and I don't wish to be rude, but they are not that sophisticated in generality. You know, the average shipping company is not a particularly sophisticated beast. They do not have emissions trading desks. They are not particularly aware of some of the complexities of the regulations that are coming their way. In most cases, they probably don't even understand half the regulations that are coming their way. And I think there is a bit of a problem coming down the line the shipping. And it either goes one way where the, the long predicted consolidation of this industry, where uh, through means of uh, the transparency requirements of finance and uh, accessibility to cargo require them to consolidate in some way. And I don't necessarily mean to MA, but you know, if you look at what Nurse Tank is currently trying to do in terms of optimizing large bits of that fragmented middle of the product tanker sector. That is what I'm talking about. You know, complexities can be dealt with uh, at scale um, through optimization of things that are cleverer than the average shipper. Um, I think the average shipper is being forced down a route where they are probably not going to be able to apply the business models that they have been using since post-war periods uh, to the next bit of our generation. The evolution of emissions, uh, ESG, uh, access to finance, um, our position within a global energy transition, um, whether that is you know, in terms of offtake agreements or generally how we get you know, ourselves ready for a series of, of fuels and infrastructures and safety requirements and regulations that are coming our way. This is not an industry that is set up for this pace of change. You know, the industry is adaptable, but not at this pace. I and mean, we, we talk about it in sort of epoch shift terms of you know, the move from uh, sail to steam to diesel. These were market-led transitions that were allowed yeah. to happen naturally, and they did not happen in a linear fashion. We're talking about changing from a single bunker 
some selection of pituitary fuels to 20 fuels and 20 different wind structures. And uh, you know, we are coming you know, inevitably towards what will become a tiered industry. It's already there, it's already happening. You have a, a, you know, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and unfortunately, the biggest part is sitting somewhere around bad or compliant. Um, and I don't know what happens to that squeeze middle, but it doesn't look great. And I would suggest that there is a lot of business models and shift companies currently in operation that are not going to survive this transition over the next 20 years. Okay, thank you for explaining that so much. I think we'll turn to the audience to see who has a question or a point. If it's a point, please keep it brief. But if it's a question, please say who you are, even if I know you, and who you wish on the panel to answer that question. Lord Mount Evans. <laughs> so, um, first of all, I thought it was an excellent uh, discussion by the panel. Thank you all so much. You have know, so much to think about and we'll chew over. Um, I want to come back on uh, you know, Clay, kicked the ball off wonderfully, and I want to follow up on something you said subsequently on the UCLOS agreement. Uh, um, just coming up to 40 years now. And it is true, of course, that the world's moved on massively, importantly. What I thought I'd just mention to you that the House of Lords. Um, the uh, International Relations and Defence Committee has just published a big report on this, precisely on some of the points that Clay was making. I don't think you're aware of this. I can't imagine you all hang on on every report that comes out of the House of Lords. It's very recent, but, uh, but do you know a bit, Richard? But it's actually very, very thoughtful. There was we had a discussion around it a couple of days ago, and um, there's a number of things in addition to things you mentioned, like uh, you know cables, uh, undersea mining, fisheries. Um, and, you know, the propensity of certain uh, states to uh, increase their EZs on, uh, you know, uh, islands or uh, man-made islands and so on, this can have a profound effect on our ability to navigate, you know, freedom of navigation and so on. So I, I do commend that report to you. I think it, it speaks very much to some of the points you make. And it very much points to some of the, um, you know, uh, problems we have to navigate in the future. The key thing, I think, in a way is, we don't want to have a new uh, UNCLOS because then, uh, you know, some of the new states want to change the rules based order to something which is more in line with how they would like to see it. We don't want a new one. We need to kind of take a step by step approach of upgrading and including addressing some of these challenges. So that's it for me. Thank that, you very much. Thank you, Jeff. I think um, if you find the link in the publication, Anyone else? Um, and Joss, I'm relying on you to tell me if there's a good question online. We've got some. We've got some questions online. And I've done my best to paraphrase them because some of them are quite long. So apologies for those online if I've missed the meaning of the questions. Uh, but the first one is: um, we talk a lot about changes in the business model. Do we actually mean cargo owners take control of their own destiny and controlling the sticky bit in the middle, which is the shipping industry? Which member of the panel would like to say yes? Well, I, I will happily, as Richard, answer this one. I don't think it's going to be particularly popular. I, I mean, referring to Martin Stockford, uh, who has made this point a few times, I think, in public. The last time the shipping industry was in any way efficient was when it was effectively run, operated, and controlled by the energy sector in the 1970s. Um, now, I'm not suggesting that we go back to that monopoly situation. But I think there is a point to be made here with the uh, uh, coming uh, CII and uh, ETS regime where the relationship between the charterer and the ship owner has to change. In order to negotiate what is a more efficient operation of those vessels, we have to think differently, not just about getting from point A to point B, but the whole operation of an integrated supply chain needs to be rethought and renegotiated. And just because charge parties that exist and have been drawn up for 150 years are what drives this industry. Does not mean to say that is what needs to power it into the future. We need to have a much better conversation between the charter and the ship owner uh, in order to make the efficiency model work. So yes, I do think there needs to be a fundamental change. Sorry, Look, I very much hope there will be a fundamental change. I think it's, it's absolutely the right way to go. But I fear it's not going to happen as speedily as we may wish. Mm -hmm. There are still some very powerful, influential ship owners in certain parts of the world uh, who take the view, well, you want to charter my ships, you'll do it on my terms, I don't care who you are. Now, you know, that's not the attitude people should be taking. 
as I said, you know, decarbonization is a, is a human endeavor. We have to succeed. There's no choice. We've got to find the quickest route to a net zero position. Uh, but there are people out there, and there's one chip owner who actually stood up on stage and said, but we only emit 3%. That's not much. How do you deal with someone like that? Mm. And, you know, this is a chap that owns tens of ships, tremendously wealthy, is making a, a huge amount of money and simply doesn't get it. Uh, that, for me, is, 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 is one of the most scary aspects. You know, I, I, I really think that you know, we need strong regulation uh, and we've got to make sure that that regulation is enforced because it's the only way I believe we're going to go forward and get to net zero as quickly as we possibly can. So, Sophia, let me ask you the same question, but in a different way. Do you buy things online? <laughs> Do you know where they're made? No. Um, Does it matter to you? No, it doesn't. Does the emissions of how they get to you matter? If the data was there, would you pay attention to it? Actually, the, the data is there in certain online shopping there, well, on certain websites where when you buy something, there are options for greener shipping. And so you pay a little bit extra and then you get your items shipped in a more, you know, birth friendly way, in a greener way. And that's something that I've been seeing more and more. Um, so I do pay attention to that. And when I see that, it's usually a very minimal cost and something that I'm, I'm happy to do because I feel better about choosing a greener shipping option. That's why the Cozeb Alliance for 2040 is the date where all fossil fuels will be removed from the consumer company supply chain instead of 2050, because they're anticipating people like you insisting on the information or making those choices. And I think that's, that's why a lot of this, I think, we were actually driven through the, the container sector. Any other questions or points in the audience? Jean Richards, um, Richard, this is probably for you, but I, I have this real concern about your concept that things can change or how they can change. I worked for a company that had contracts of freightment, almost invented contracts of freightment with large fleets in the early 70s. I set up a company in the early 80s to go cargo first with the idea of taking responsibility to the charter who would then actually have a group of ships that they could access. The market died on me and the company died. Even seven, eight years later, people were asking me what happened to Magna because there was this idea that you have that it should be now cargo driven. The biggest problem, and I would like your reaction to this, is the one of money. As soon as you take control of the scheduling, back into a charter's pocket, the charging company will want somebody that knows how to work the market, the ships, and somebody who is a trader on the commodity. So the commodity section has got a, a target pocket and the shipping section has to be uh, have a target profit. And then the cargo suddenly needs a ship and insists that the shipping department give him a ship, even if the ship has to ballast, ballast the whole way around the world. So the economics for the chartering and the economy of using their ships goes out of the window because they've lost the money. And the charging department can do a trade which they probably shouldn't have done in the first place because the only way they can make it profitable is to get a cheap ship from their shipping division. So your concept that the control goes back to chartering or cargo, I believe ignores the reality of the market we live in, which is something goes wrong and there isn't a ship or there isn't a cargo, and somebody's got to close that gap. So I like your reaction. I completely agree that that is the reality of the situation at the moment, because you've got a lot of, uh, you've, got, you've got people on both sides, the charters and the ship owners that will stand up to global maritime forums and say, this is all about collaboration. And they may well mean it, but the reality is that when it comes to those chartering decisions, 
they're sort of you know three down the line uh you know have their own targets and their own requirements to meet and they are going to make economic decisions, not idealistic decisions. so unless there is a top-down approach from these companies where they do things differently things won't change and the reality of the economics are exactly as you point out i'm not suggesting that the cargo interests necessarily take full control over this. what i am saying is there needs to be a different conversation in terms of how that collaboration between owners and charters is going to work and the difference between long-term charters and spot you know because that's what we're talking about here. it's not necessarily the same thing i don't know the detail i'll be honest you know, i'm a near humble pack as you well know and um i just suggest that the established ways of doing things and drawing up charter party agreements is in contradiction to the reality of what we are trying to do to increase the efficiency of the entire supply chain. It would make no sense to have a ship that steams full speed ahead across the Atlantic and you just sit there waiting for five days because the congestion is such that it cannot get in before. A, a more holistic view of the supply chain and getting cargoes from A to B needs to be more integrated and there needs to be a better balance of incentives that takes into account efficiency, not just economics. Scope, uh, scope three missions. Jeez. Just come back. Hang on a second. There's a, a thing second. called slow speed steaming and the ship would slow steam and actually consume less fuel than one of your modern eco ships. I think the problem is because of all the data that is coming out because of CII, even slow steaming an empty ship around the world isn't going to look good. And the scope three emissions of the ships being reported by the cargo and being reported by the bankers, by the insurers, are going to mean that that will not happen, just won't be allowed to happen, if you like. So, but I do think different sectors, this is another key point. Point to point, large container ships is a different solution to, you know, um, dry bulk, small right. dry bulk ships and stuff. So there will be there will be different solutions to Joss, any any yeah well I think we can stick on CII. So uh, there's a question here saying uh, owners and charters are already openly talking about workarounds in regards to CII, which could actually mean additional tonnage coming onto the water. CII is not the game changer that we thought it would be. What regulation will be? I'm not sure I know. I'm not sure I know the answer to that. <laughs> I'll pass on that one. Richard. Um, yeah, CII is flawed, and we know that. Um, but as Tristan has pointed out, it's flawed because the fundamental principles in the IMO were weak and did not allow CII to be you know, as, as enforceable uh, with teeth as we would have liked. So we go back to the IMO in terms of the agreements and the level of ambition, getting the numbers right, uh, and, and having a serious conversation about that. I would say on CII, yes, there is a workaround, and there is the option that you could, uh, you know, expend your effort as a company circumventing the spirit of a piece of legislation that was put in there to increase efficiency and do something that is contradictory to that. But I would question why you would want to do that. Um, you know, doing sort of uh, donuts in the Atlantic with no cargo for three months in order to get your rating back up seems to be a very weird way to spend your day. Um, I think there is an element of the shipping industry needing to uh, go with the spirit of what is intended here rather than yet again seeking weird workarounds and trying to circumvent it a la scrubbers. Um, you know, we know what we're trying to do, so you know, do it. Don't try and find you know ways to not do it just because uh, it might be five cents cheap on the on the ton mile. You know, you're even better giving answers than asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm allowed to have an opinion. Of this one. It's great. <laughs> Any other questions? In the... Yes, should grind. So I will save time by saying. Okay. Try and avoid. Um, I just wanted to try and bring together some of the points already made. It could be through Richard, I think, across the panel. Sorry, Richard, to particularly focus on you, but I think it's across the panel more generally. A couple of things. Firstly, I'm, I'm sure the fleet average 
upside of Clyde is correct. But what I would say, and this is also true, given the scale of the increase in the world fleet over the last several decades, there are a lot more bigger players in the space than there were 20 years ago. So I think that's quite important. You know, you can use statistics for a number of things. And that's quite important, I think, in terms of um, informing the space going forward. But what we've also seen and, and articulated today is the challenge that we're facing very clearly and the need to finance that fundamentally. You know, and the mix of financing has changed quite dramatically over the past several decades. Certainly in aggregate, there is a lot less um, bank debt in the global marketplace. I think there's a, there's a lot more leasing in the marketplace, um, but there's still a lot of equity in, in that whole space and a lot more equity than there was several decades ago. Is, is, and we've also seen that sectors will behave differently. I think that is very important to acknowledge. But in, in terms of moving forward, is there some correlation, if you like, between that squeeze on the middle and what the financing of the change that's coming down the line requires in order to get things done? That, that's really the fuck, you know. It's not just the industry that's got to change, it's the finance industry that needs to, to sort of produce this several trillion dollars. So, Richard, to start with, across the space. I would probably phone Michael for an opinion on yeah. that, if I was writing an article on it. But, I mean, you know, we, we have had this debate about uh, you know, the intentions of, we just reduced the, the bank debt aspects of it. You look at what the design and principles set out to do, which is to start with, account for where their portfolios are in terms of those emissions. But the inevitable consequence of accounting for it is that you then have to make decisions about where that capital goes. So you are essentially you know, setting yourself the trajectory and saying that we will give money to those prepared to stay on the right side of this trajectory. That's about access to finance. It's about access to cargo. It's about access to financing. You only get access to finance if you are prepared to make those right decisions. Now, I think that works in the majority, but the reality is that we have an existing fleet that, you know, on paper should run for 20 year lifespans. So we're talking about retrofitting. We're talking about how do we squeeze the most out of the existing fleet while we are transitioning to those new ships that are going to come down the line. And I don't know, I will bow to the experts on the panel, but it strikes me that there is a gap in those numbers, isn't there? Well, I think that I mean, it's not fair to ask, I'm not going to ask Mr. to say anything. He wrote a very good um, report for Given to Zero Coalition called the Transition Strategy, which sets out, you can get it on globalmaritimeforum.org and you find it there, which talks about how the industry gets to 2050. And most of the capital expenditure until 2050 is retrofitting, not new vessels. So, mm -hmm new vessels only begin to take over. And the whole key to this is the def you order a zero emission ship by 2030, it's 5% of all fuel is zero emission, but that becomes a tipping point where that is all you order, and that's all the ship builders are building. So, but that will get financed. Banks who signed up to the Net Zero Banking Alliance have to forecast the emissions in our, all our portfolios. So, Myself, my colleagues, and everyone else, and all the industries we have in the city, and every bank and side has to forecast the emissions from lending to whichever sector it is, in what those emissions will be in 2030, with the baseline being what they are effectively in 2023 or 24 when we make that. So, if the clients we have lower their emissions by 30%, and I forecast my emissions to be lower by 30%, the amount of capital we have stays constant. And that's what we've done for our energy and power sectors earlier this year. So it is a it is a mutually beneficial thing. So we want to finance retrofitting for lower emissions. So we will today, in fact, sorry, tomorrow, the signatures to the side of the we're going to have 30, we represent two thirds of the strategic finance. We will disclose to ourselves uh, our emissions for 2021 in terms of how they align to the IMO's projection. 
that will be published in the middle of next month. It is affected by COVID, but we are being transparent about it. And every time some of us say we're out of alignment, I have to explain to our sustainability people why that is. And the point is that as soon as we can, the loans that go back to less efficient ships get repaid, or have been repaid in some cases in the last 12 months, we can put capital to the new technologies because that's what we want to do. That's why I am confident. That's what the 130 trillion uh, of GFATs represent, particularly the asset managers invested. They want to put that money into this, which is why I think it will happen. But they need the rules, they need the definitions, they need the accounting rules. And those are all being worked on. So I think we're still in what I call the phony war around this. And things are happening. Uh, and, and so we will. I'm not worried about whether this gets financed. So for the squeeze middle, it is about retrofitting the difficulty of the squeeze middle, unless they partner up with other members of the squeeze middle, is how are they going to pay for one of these more expensive ships? Because they are going to be more expensive. And does it matter that they're more expensive? No, because the cargo owner will pay the rate. You pay the rate because society wants it to do it. The question I would raise on this is if that is the case, then why is it not the case that every ship going anywhere near a repair yard? or a dry docking, or any kind of special survey, is not spending money on existing technology that is proven with a two to three year payback that will reduce your emissions. Because it's not happening. It's not happening at the scale that what Michael has just said would suggest needs to happen. Michael, can I just say that yeah. I, I disagree with your analysis in that I do not believe that the commercial sector will finance the decarbonisation of our, of our industry by itself. Uh, I don't believe there is a stomach there to do it. And you keep talking about this 130 trillion or whatever it is. These people know nothing about our industry. Ours is a very specialist, dedicated industry. It's a dangerous sector to get into. And I can't see private equity and all these hedge funds come piling in. They're not doing that now. So why should they come in in the future? The, the evidence that I have seen is this. In 2007, and I did a little bit of research on this before I gave a speech recently, Something like 130 billion has been made available every single year, new money into the shipping and offshore industries. Last year, it was 31 billion from banks and financial institutions. Private equity was less than six. There's, there's hardly anything coming in from the capital markets. Uh, my firm did a float for a firm called Taylor Marine. Biggest float, big, big jamboree, 225 million pounds. Um, how much is coming in, in from the bond market? At its height in 2012, it was about 20 billion. It was about 600 million in 2019, and I haven't seen any figures to show me that it's going higher than that. So my, my personal view is this. The money will come into the industry if it's, if it's guaranteed or backed by government. I don't see our industry being, being decarbonized and financed properly without the support of governments. These new ships that are going to be built, Michael, are going to have to have export credit agency guarantees. And that's the only time the banks will come in. I don't see the banks taking risks on new technology. You know, you're going to have an ammonia-powered vessel. How long is that vessel going to last for? No one really knows. How is it going to perform? No one really knows until they're actually out there on the on the high seas. So, you know, I, I you know I hear what you say about this 130 trillion. I just don't believe any of that. I'm sorry. I, I don't believe in private equity. And I don't believe in these funds. Not so far as industry is concerned, because they've never stepped up. What I really hope is that government comes in, supports our industry in the way they should do, and helps us to decarbonize, because it's in everybody's interest for them to do so. And on the whole, export credit agencies never lose money. And they'll be supporting their national interests, the Koreans, the Japanese, the Italians, the Germans, hopefully the United Kingdom through UK EF. Uh, they'll be supporting shipbuilding and conversions in, in their own nation. And that will give incentive to banks and financial institutions. They've always been the mainstay of the financing for our industry, and I do not see that changing. Um, some very good questions you raised there. I, 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 a carbon levy, of course, is essential to place the cost gap in some way. And of course, governments have to be a key part of it, which is why green corridors and flight bank declaration is such an important announcement in Glasgow around the governments recognizing the need to decarbonize shipping through decarbonizing particular trade routes. So that has to be collaborative with cargo and shipping to another one because of the cost of it. So 
<laughs> but I do what I do think is the private sector in collaboration with governments is the only way it will happen. But I think society is saying it's got to happen because of the emissions and what's going to, to the planet. So um, I think we're, uh, Tristan is willing to give you a private consultation uh, rather than doing it in front of everyone else here. Uh, it's, it, yes, please. It's, do we have any time constraints, Joss, except? Um, Can we go uh, to six? Two more. I'll be short. Um, my name is Alega Shepherd. I just admire Clay um, Maitland. He's well known for his optimism. And today he presented the big picture with a big blast and uh, disaster. Um, across the table, Harry appeared to be the pragmatism, and I absolutely agree with him, whatever he said. Um, because the ship owners, particularly the ship owners, the Greek ship owners, also did that, and they express their view in cycles. They're not, they find it very difficult. My question is considering the mainstream shipping, which we know currently, uh, do you think these extraordinary figures that, that, that are unimaginable and the government will not support anything because they haven't got money and we pay more taxes anyway? Do you think the mainstream shipping will survive or disappear? And with them, we go be the buddies, I hope. Um, and then the shipping is not the shipping we know today, but is the shipping of uh, the big beasts. I think we'll just leave that hanging in the air. Because, because I, I, there are two answers, close right. We've now got also. I think, can we go to the back? Jean's had a go. There's some other back. Sorry, Jean. Hello there, yeah. Um, my name's Robert Abadar. Um, what I wanted to ask the panel is, all the alternative fuels being mentioned um, have got their own environmental impacts, ammonia, ethanol, and I think you're mentioning burning, obviously, CO2, which obviously CO2 is not combustible, so you'd have to mix it with hydrogen or something else. Is this greenwashing? Is it really, is there another way? I mean, does the panel ever believe something like nuclear or I, I think someone also mentioned um, carbon capture. So I, I just feel that you've got, you've got to weigh up the actual benefit of the lowering emissions switching from fossil fuel, but there's an impact from the other fuels and are they one in the same? It's just a convenient greenwash. I think it's a good question. Again, this, this panel is not really qualified to answer the technical aspect of the question, Tristan Smith is, but it's a very good point. But one of the way we're going to measure that is through emissions on a life cycle basis. So in the Poseidon principle, we've committed to add a 1.5 well to weight greenhouse gas trajectory, which is what 130 trillion is about. So that will capture the point carried to about methanol it will capture the upstream emissions of the manufacturing of the fuels, and that will prevent a lot of the greenwashing and green hushing. But your question is a very valid one, and, and my ship owners who have not got the capital or the desire to make a choice are hanging back if they don't want to choose, and you don't have to make the wrong choice. Michael, there is a lot of greenwashing going on. Um, I, I, I don't know whether that's what you're alluding to. Um, there have been some uh, so-called green bonds recently. Um, uh, any fool can draft a document saying that if you lower your emissions, I'll give you a lower rate. You don't have to, but it's still a green bond. And the bank will go out and say, yeah, we've just done a green bond. Uh, what is a ship owner actually doing? You've done the bond, but is he actually complying with it? Uh, we had a, a, a situation recently where one of the oil majors um, managed to, uh, to shift uh, a million barrels of oil on VLCC on a net zero basis, because they 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 uh, they they swap some tax credits. Uh, sorry, I'm just a lawyer. How does that work? Uh, you know, how can it be? How can it be net zero just because you bought some 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 some, some credits? I, that that's just nonsense. And this is what we've got to get around here. You know, you know, there's a a, a, a very concerted effort by the City of London um, to to become involved. Uh, in a green financing, it's called the Green Finance Initiative. It was set up by a former Lord Mayor, uh, a colleague of, of, of Lord Mount Evans, 
Um, they've got all the right ideas uh, and they, they really do want to move forward. They've been mandated by the government back in 2017. Because of COVID and various other issues, they haven't done very much. But you know, they are the people who've got good ideas on how to do it properly. You know, you know, for me, a green bond isn't the bond that says that you know that you know you're a good company now, and if you lower your emissions that little more, then the rate goes down. Uh, well, the shipper doesn't really care. He knows he's going to be paying X, so if he can't lower it, so what? He's still got his bond, but it's still classed as a green bond, and I think that's just wrong. I think Harry makes a very good point. A lot of this stuff. Is, is going to have to be eliminated. I mean, that's what definitions and real emissions data is going to help change behavior. I mean, actually, the Japanese issued green bonds for scrubbing. So, no, that was the early green. Did you want to say something? Well, no, the, the, the only point I would make about your question is I think it's the wrong question. I think it's, it's not the fuel itself, it's how the fuel is produced. That's why I mentioned the fact that this is not about the fuel we put in tanks, this is about the energy transition the governments are. Uh, effectively trying to enact. So, you know, ammonia, if it's produced uh, through non-green uh, electricity, is absolutely awful. Uh, but if it is produced in a green way, then, you know, then we can start talking about life cycle analysis. This is why it's important that we're talking about the shipping industry sending the right demand signals about offtake agreements and having that availability, and not about the specifics of what fuel goes where. We're going to have lots of different fuels. But we need to send those demand signals to the energy companies and the governments now to ensure that we're having the right kind of fuels. And we're talking about life cycle analysis, we're not talking about rain. Uh, and it, and it's, it's going to be challenging. Can I just add one thing? And then, you know, so obvious that I, I don't know if it's a valuable thing to say, but during the entire environmental purification process that our, our world has been undergoing, since Rachel Carson wrote her book, famous book about, about uh, the sea, uh, sea around us and various, you know, we're talking about the late 1950s. The entire environmental movement has been powered not by us in the shipping industry, but by, of course, public will and by politics and by the voters. And there is a huge environmental vote in this Let's take the United Kingdom, for example. Does anybody here know how many members there are of the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds? There's a heck of a lot more voters in that organization than in any of the shipping organizations that we know here in the United Kingdom or in the United States or in Greece. We are the bump on the tail of an elephant compared to the public will. Governments, as as I think we, uh, Michael said before, are the are the driving force. They respond to the voters. They are going to tell the industry what to do. It isn't going to be necessarily what we want or what you want or what, what, what a ship owner or a charterer wants. It's going to be what will enable that ship to operate on the oceans of the world. And even in a country like China, I think that imperative is what is powering this entire discussion not whether ammonia is a safe fuel one of the things about ammonia is not particularly safe fuel for the crew to handle they themselves the seafarers are going to have a lot of problem with some of these new fuels but that's something that the governments are going to have to decide it's not going to come from us i'm sorry to tell you that is it a good one jay gene <laughs> Well, now the second pot because I'm the second oldest person in this room, so I think I'm entitled. Um, people who are as old as Claire and I will remember that this seminar and this din dinner came from the IMIF, was inherited from Jim Davis, and the IMIF started with scrap and build. So I would like the panel to tell me whether they think scrap and build will be green washing. <laughs> because the cost of carbon emissions from producing the steel to build new ships, rather than keeping the old ships going, running at slow speed, burning less fuel, is a better option than building more new ships and doing a scrap and build, which will in itself be carbon positive. Yeah, we'll leave that. I think everyone agrees with you, unless the new ships are 
new technology using zero emission or very low emission. It's the life cycle issue and the circular economy issue, which we haven't got time to talk about. Um, Joss, I think probably I mean, one, have to wrap up. Well, I'm going to invite the panel to give one last thing you've heard to yourselves. You can mm. agree with yourself or you can disagree with someone else. But I just want you to make each of you a closing comment about how optimistic, pessimistic you are <coughs> and what biggest change will have happened in this industry, in your opinion, in 10 years' time. Harry. Well, I very much hope that governments, um, particularly the EU, uh, the United Kingdom, and hopefully the US, uh, will force the hand of the IMO. Um, you know, the IMO target of, of reducing emissions by 50% of what they were in 2008 is just really not acceptable. And I think the IMO realizes that, but there's a lot of pressure on them. Uh, my hope is that we will bring a net zero position as close as possible as we can to today. I think there will be huge challenges there, but that's my great hope. I think, you know, for my children and my grandchildren, that is my great hope. Sophia? Well, um, I think it's all of our great hope that we can reduce emissions, but I think that the IMO needs to step in. We need a more firm regulatory framework. We need actual guidelines on how we can reduce emissions. Um, and as some of the audience members pointed out, we can switch to alternative fuels, but what are the implications of producing those fuels, running those fuels in the life cycle of the ship? Mm -hmm. And also how do we deal with, let's say, a spill of ammonia in, in the seas? We don't understand much of that at the moment. Um, so I think that what we need apart from the IMO getting together and coming up with a more sound regulatory framework is we also need the maritime clusters in the world to work together. Um, for example, we have New York and London working together to the world's biggest financial centers. And I think that we can be pioneers at the forefront of uh, innovation, but there's other maritime clusters that can also assist in that and each cluster can bring in their specialty and we can work together to have a more cohesive uh, way forward. Richard. Uh, I hope the IMO still exists and retains some relevance. Frankly, I think that is in the balance right now. Um, I hope that shipping is more expensive in order to account for the purpose it serves done properly in a more integrated global supply chain where shipping actually recognizes its position not in isolation, but as part of a global value chain. And if those mentality shifts are made, I think we can look towards a more positive, slightly more boring and predictable shipping industry, where it's probably less exciting to be a journalist and have opinions on it, but it's probably better for the climate in the moment. I don't know whether it will, but I hope. So, Clay, you get the penultimate word because I get the last word. Well, penultimate, we don't have to talk about clusters if you don't. I, I can't spell, I cannot spell penultimate, but I can spell cluster. Uh, I would say that uh, the important thing, and Rich's point is a good one uh, that he just made. If the IMO continues to exist, it's going to be because, be because certain governments wanted it to. If the IMO is going to be more effective, in the environmental area than it is now, it will be because governments, mem certain member governments pushed in that direction. Right now, as you heard, that's not happening. Um, but, uh, and again, at the beginning of this discussion today, we talked about China and the possibility of, of a tragic war between Taiwan and, and China. If something like that happens, it will, I fear, slow the whole process that we've been talking about down very considerably. And it will give a much longer life, I fear, to the kind of substandard tonnage that we have referred to uh, indirectly uh, during our discussion on, uh, on, on de decarbonization. That is, those are the big questions in the room that we can't answer. 
but they are very, very important questions if we are going to get to the point of answering whether decarbonization will work within the foreseeable future. Thank you, Greg. Before I thank the panel, when I speak to my colleagues and any audience, I like to hope they've been educated, but also just to make sure they get educated, is to share a book. I'm not going to give it to anyone. You come take a picture with your iPhone. This is how the world really works. And Harry will like this book because it talks about really the importance of the fossil fuel industry in, sorry, Tristan, the fossil fuel industry in so many things of our daily lives and why if we listen to extremists on either side, it isn't actually very helpful. I, we have to be pragmatic about it and why even in fact in Tristan's work, fossil fuels still a, a, a minority but a major part of the sources of energy, more gas than oil. And this is a very important book to read, I think, just to understand how important that is. And I suggest that every, every um, person who sticks themselves to the road or throws paint on a picture should be forced to read this book twice because you can't stop oil. It's a gradual, mm -hmm. long-term process. But in so many things, we just take for granted that the fossil fuel industry makes happen. And that's actually called civilization. And the issue for developing countries is they want some of that civilization too, and there's no way they will get it unless many of the things that we're trying to get rid of, uh, we get, if we get rid of them too quickly, they won't get it. So I'll leave it here you can come and take a picture. There is a camera on you filming it, so if anyone walks off with it, you will be <laughs> identified. Um, but I, the one thing I think I want to end with before thanking the panel is a lot of what we discussed today and a lot of the issues the interest being shown by governments shows the importance of this industry. And so let's not underestimate that actually as a result of COVID, the ever given, a number of other things, decarbonization being key, this industry is now much more on the front pages and in policymakers thinking. And that is a very good thing because what we do, and the point raised by panel members about seafarers and things, so some of the things we often talk about within the industry and are much more in the public domain. Uh, and we should keep pushing those themes in order to get governments to uh, do the right things. So please join me in thanking the panel for a very interesting, provocative discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.